pleasant morning or pleasant evening rather pleasant evening I'm Bishop Trevor Williams of Paul and Praise Ministries and I'm continuing on this serial Showers of Pentecost Gifts of the Holy Spirit Gifts of the Holy Spirit Let us pray Father in heaven you reveal yourself to us in the person of the glorious Father in the person of Jesus Christ the Son in the person of the blessed Holy Spirit I pray even now that you cleanse me of my sins and fill me blessed Holy Spirit the devil doesn't want me to do this recording but Lord I pray that you stand with me and cleanse me and fill me and empower me lead me in paths of righteousness the limb from evil I pray for your for the audience that Lord you prepare their hearts for your word Lord, we are trusting you, looking to you. Empower me now. Empower your people and liberate us. In your precious name I pray. Amen. So we are continuing where we left off last week. And um, our scripture text for today, 1 Corinthians 12, now about spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters. I do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were controlled and led astray to demons. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. The theme is the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit blesses every saved person with spiritual gifts. Let us bear that in mind. Every saved person is blessed with spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, there is no need for anybody to feel inadequate. No one to feel inadequate and feel as if that person is less than anybody else. Because we are all blessed with spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts by the Holy Spirit. We are told here, that there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but in same Lord, different service. It's very important that we understand that. Different kinds of gifts. The gift will determine the service or the ministry. The service here has to do with the ministry that you offer. And that is dependent on the gifts you have. But the person who has the gift of pastor is not expected to be doing the gift, the work of an uh, evangelist. I have been to meetings, different groups, and I have heard persons introduce the pastor of the church as evangelist Sam. Evangelist Sam, just use a name. And I said to myself, how could the pastor be evangelist? Johnson, Evangelist, Watson, or Williams. How could that be? If you're a pastor, you're a pastor. If you're an evangelist, you're an evangelist. And this is a confusion that exists in Christendom. People don't, their church groups, especially those that use leaders who are untrained, they don't seek to understand that words have meaning. And the Bible has meaning. You don't just say things for the sake of saying them. If, if a pastor, Evangelist Johnson, that is not sensible. That is not correct either. That is totally wrong. The pastor is a pastor. Evangelist is evangelist. It says there are different kinds of service. So the pastor will be doing a particular service. And the evangelist will be doing a different kind of service. Or a different kind of ministry. There are those who are Bible teachers, and they are not expected to do the work of the evangelist. His ministry is different. There are those who have the calling to do deliverance. Every Christian should be doing it, but I realize that not many churches are able to do it. One percent of the Christian community concerns itself with deliverance ministry. I am in a deliverance ministry, and I realize the problem. Persons are not able to do it and they don't they're not keen on doing it and, and learning it 
But a person who has that ministry, will, you will find that his service is somewhat different from the person who has the ministry of evangelist or the regular pastor. There are different kinds of working. Understand that? Different kinds of working. But in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Don't expect that my ministry must be similar to yours. And if it is different, you question it. For example, we see Elijah in the Bible um, ministering to people, prophesying, raising the dead, lying down on the dead. We don't see people doing it these days, but he did it. Elisha succeeded him. And Elisha also laid down on dead people. But not only that, Elisha used uh, things like salt to carry out his ministry. There is no record that Elijah used salt to minister to people. Elijah, Elisha uh, told people to go and dip, told them to go and dip in the River Jordan. There is no record that Elijah did that. There is no record that Elijah was involved in miracles apart from straight ministry of prophecy, preaching the word and teaching the word. Elisha told Naaman to dip in River Jordan. Elisha told, asked the woman, what is it you have in the house? She said, a pot of oil. He said, use it and pour it out, borrow vessels and pour into the vessels and fill them. That is another working, but it's the same spirit. Same spirit. But in all of them, and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. The Holy Spirit manifests in us differently, but it's for the common good. So you see uh, Elisha lying down on the dead person. We don't see Elijah doing it. We don't see Jeremiah doing that. We see the Apostle Paul doing it. In the book of Acts, he was having all-night meeting, and this fellow fell asleep, and the Bible says he fell into a deep sleep, and he fell headlong and broke his neck. And the Apostle Paul went down, and he laid down on him, and embraced him, and the fellow was restored to life again. We see that happening. We don't see... Uh, other people doing it. Peter raised the dead and so on. But you don't see John lying down and dead or raising the dead and so on. Different ministry, different working, but for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. I've met people with this ministry. They have a word of wisdom and when they talk, you listen. It, it, is, it, it sounds right. A message of wisdom, a word of wisdom. I've been in meetings where persons were deliberating and deliberating and deliberating, and this person just spoke. And that, that settled it, it was clearly understood and received, and it sounded so practical and real. To another message of knowledge, God has blessed me with this one. I, I, I would love him to bless me with a word of, uh, message of wisdom too. But he has blessed me with a message of knowledge. I just come and speak the thing without knowing anything. And I have had the experience in my ministry where I remember the sister saying to me on one occasion, she had to run, run down her sister after church, run her down. And she told her, no, I didn't talk. She didn't tell me what it was. And I didn't ask. She said, Something happened that both of them knew. She and the sister knew about it. I don't know what, what I can't tell you what it was. And I came this Sunday morning and was preaching it. And when she turned her head and looked, she saw that the sister was really wrenching and the sister was hurt deeply. She knew the person and the nature of the person. So as soon as service was dismissed, the person bolted from the church, mad. She said she had to run her down and touch her and said, no, I did not talk. I did not tell pastor. 
And I just use one case. It has happened time and again and again. Persons have come to me and said, you know, you preach so and so and so. And I know you did not know. Word of knowledge. By means of the same spirit. So the person with the word of wisdom might not have, might not be blessed with the word of knowledge or the message of knowledge. But the Bible says they are operating by the same spirit. To another faith, I have been told of persons in meetings, church meetings I'm talking, who, ha who have this faith. And it's she, this person was telling me, was telling me of, of a particular meeting in the denomination with the, the president and, and uh, uh, elders and so on. And she was not really an elder or a bishop or a president or superintendent or pastor. But it was known that she had that gift. And they had been de deliberating and they took a decision. And then she got up and said, listen. And she expressed herself, her, her views on the matter. And that settled it. And she said they, they, they needed money to do a particular work in the ministry of the denomination. And they had come, they had discussed it and had decided they would take up pledges the following year. And she said, the sister got up and said, no, we're going to start this year. And just by, you know, they accepted it. And by they opened up to it, they were able to collect, they were able to collect something in the region of a million dollars on this part. Both collection and pledges on this part. And that started it off. She, she said to me, it was known in the denomination that she was blessed with the gift of faith. So to another faith by the same spirit, what we need to do in the churches is that we need to recognize the gifts of different ones. And when we see the gift of that person at work, we accept it. You don't push it aside. You don't have to be jealous of the person. Because flesh as a way to chip in, and, and the devil, demons, and the, and the evil, and the sin nature, where although it is known the person has a gift, a particular, a particular gift, when per other people see the, the gift at work in the life of the person, they, they resist it. I've been in church since 1968. I was baptized as a child, primary school. I've seen these things. People, there is no need for me to begrudge you and to be jealous of you I try to rival you. I have a gift. You have yours. I have mine. You use yours and I recognize it, acknowledge it, and I love it. I use mine and you do the same to another faith. To another gifts of healing by the same spirit. So yes, your people pray, believers pray for one another who are not feeling well and so on. And they generally um, request prayer, I request that you pray for them. Understand though, that although prayer is powerful and it works, and the task has also been entrusted in the bishop, the Bible says so in the last chapter of the book of James, to heal people. Yet there are persons who are not bishops, are pastors, they are members of the church, might not even be given an office but they are blessed with the gift of healing and we should recognize that and know when the, uh, the healer or a person is blessed with that gift and when that person is around and we allow that person to operate in the ministry we continue in first corinthians 12 it says to another miraculous powers how many churches open up to this and let me tell you, we have, to be, we have to be very careful when it comes to spiritual gifts. Because everything God does, Satan has a counterfeit. There are those who will come. I remember watching this video of this service. And I was assessing it in the spirit. There's something about it that was very strange. And this man, the leader, I don't know what title he went by was preaching and he had the Bible in one hand and he was just touching people, touch them, touch them and they were falling over, pitching over, pitching over, pitching over, pitching over and I said, no, something about this is not right at all. You have to assess things in the spirit. 
you assess things in the spirit. Jesus didn't go around touching people and pitching them over. Well, he didn't really push them. He didn't. There's this thing of slain these days. Slain, slain, slain. I have touched people and they, and they were and they got slain. I remember this lady in this fasting service who testified at a point in the service that she had been having cancer. She had been fighting it for 14 years and she had lost the battle. And she came to the fasting service. She just came because the doctor had given her three months to live. And she was in there, I think, this last week or third week of the last month. She had done her funeral program, selected a burial spot. She had been confined to a wheelchair. She had been put in pampers and, and so on. And I, at a point, was walking in the audience. People were standing up. She was standing up. And I was just led to touch her on the forehead. Just touch her. And she fell. So I know that there's such a thing. I did not push her down. I did not know she was going to fall. But she fell on the ground. She fell. She fell. And the good thing is she got up without the cancer. And that was from 2011. And she's alive now. And she had been given. She was in the last week or third week of the last month. And she had put all preparation in place. She had given up her two-year-old child for adoption. Because she, she had been told she was not going to live. Miraculous powers. Healing. But you have to be very careful. We have to learn to try the spirit. To another prophecy. Now what is prophecy? Because there is this thing about prophecy in our time. In the Bible, as recorded in the Bible, the prophets were not loved. But in, in our time, we notice people rushing prophets, running them down to get a word. Something is not, something does not line up. Prophecy really means to foretell and to foretell. To foretell means to predict the future. To foretell means to preach. Preach the word. People don't want to hear the word uh, preach, but they want to hear something that God says. God says, come here, come here. God says, come here, come here. The Spirit says, God says, and so on. No, and they flock these people, and they flock these churches that have these prophets. But as I said, Isaiah was that love. Jesus was Almighty God in the flesh, in human form. Was not loved. People followed him for fish and bread. They followed him for what they could get. But when he, and in St. John 6, when he told them the requirements of the kingdom of God, they left him. His church came down to 12. <clears throat> the prophets were not loved. Use the Bible as a guide. When you see people with these uh, stadium churches, stadium-sized churches with thousands of people, Coming to hear prophecy, not coming to hear the preaching of the word. Something is not right. Because that's not what we see in the Bible. The Bible has to be our guide. And the Bible tells us that in the last days there will be these prophets. There will be a multitude of prophets. And God eventually is going to throw them in the lake of fire. The prophets I mentioned. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. I remember this woman going around telling people that um, demons couldn't speak in tongues. And I was being contradicted, members of my church were being told that, and I was contradicted that demons could not speak tongues. And it's not true. Demons speak tongues. I've seen it. And the person who contradicted me, the member of my church at the time who contradicted me, came to learn at a point that demons could speak, in speak in tongues. L listen to this. Demons imitate God in everything. Satan imitates God in everything. There's one thing in which the demons and, and Satan cannot imitate God. And that is the character of God, the fruit of the Spirit. But they, can, they do imitate God in everything. Don't allow any one to follow. They imitate God in everything. Everything. Right? But they cannot imitate the character of God. So you have to listen, you have to make sure that the tongue that is being spoken is one from the Holy Spirit. I have been in meetings where persons, this sister, a member of my church, started to speak in tongues. And 
persons were there who could interpret tongues. And they said she was speaking real nasty Jamaican bad words. It sounded sweet. We, and she was a member of the church I was pastoring at the time. I remember one particular morning when this person came, a member of the church came with a ganja plant in a little pan and asked me to curse it because the community in which we were operating was saturated with that. It was bad in the community and they wanted to bring an end to it. And then she got up and she started to speak this particular tongue. It, it sounded so sweet and we thought it was confirmation. It's subsequent to that, it was discovered that she was really cursing bad words. So what she was doing when I was doing that is countering it. And I've had the experience that in the ministry I'm, I'm now in, persons there are spoken in tongues and you could feel the effect that they were countering what was going on, cursing it. But the fact remains that speaking in tongues is a gift and ministry of the Holy Spirit. There are church groups that ban it as a no speaking tongues. And that I remember being in this at this conference and there were the only leaders were saying, you know, those who were speaking, and I believe the others agreed, that no tongue should be speaking in the church, should be spoken in the church. No tongue should be spoken in the church. None. And that the Bible says tongue shall cease. No, the Bible does say tongue shall cease. But the context of it uh, is not saying it has ceased. Based on the context, it, it is not saying speaking in tongues has ceased. It shall, if it shall, is future tense. But there's a delicate, delicate balance between counterfeit tongues and genuine tongues. And this is where the churches go adrift. This is what is messing up the churches. Now, the Bible says there must be interpretation, and this is very, very important. The church where there is no interpreter in the church is to interpret the tongues. One has to be very careful. Now I know why the Holy Spirit says there must be an interpreter. Because you need to know what is being said. The persons can be there countering what is being preached and what is being taught and, and, and a, a, a right word. And as in that case, cursing real bad words. Bad words. One has to be careful. And to, and to steal another, the interpretation of tongues. So the person who speaks might not be an interpreter. But it is important that there is interpretation. It is important that the audience know what is being said or what has been said. Very, very important. There must be interpretation of tongues in the church. I've been to meetings where I've seen people speak and the same person interpret. I've been into other meetings where I see people speak in tongues and somebody else interprets. No problem, so long as there's interpretation. All these are the work of one and the same spirit. One and the same spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines, God determines how to distribute them. God determines whom to select for what. There were many Israelites, the Israelites at the time when God called Moses, could have been in a number of a million people. God went to Midian and called Moses. Yes, he was a Jew. But he called someone whom he had prepared. Anybody God calls, God prepares. Moses did not know that God was preparing him at a burning bush. He was standing on holy ground and that was part of his purification. But not only that, God told him to put his hand in his bosom and, then he, and he did so. When he took it out, his, his, his hand was leprous, white as snow. He must have been sharp. Leprous in the Bible speaks of sin. God told him to put it back in his bosom. He did so. He took it out. It was whole again. God had prepared him. 
God told him to drop his rod. The rod became a snake. Again, he was shot. God told him to take it up by the tail. He did so and became a normal rod again. God had put something in the rod. Notice that God said to him, when you're going back to Egypt to lead the people of Israel, you're going to take this rod with you. Don't leave it. Take it with you. At the river, at the, at the Red Sea, when the, uh, the, they got there and Pharaoh was coming behind them. And whether Pharaoh had decided to come or not, God had decided to take them across the Red Sea. God, but at that point, fear was coming and the people were panicking and crying and, you know, behaving rudely. And some were even blaspheming. God asked Moses, what is that you have in your hand? He said, a rod. Or my rod. A rod or my rod. God said, use it. Moses was going to discover now that there was something about it that was different. It, was, it didn't only have the ability or the power in it to become a serpent, but it could use it to part the Red Sea. Later, he learned it could use it to strike the rock. God brought water from the rock twice, as recorded in, in the Bible. The first time, he was to use the rod to strike it. The second time, he was, he was told to speak. Well, he struck it two times. First time and the second time. But it, when he struck it, he realized that there was something about the rod. God had prepared the rod. God had prepared him. <clears throat> Anybody God calls for ministry, God equips. The devil does like that. I have had encounters with demon-possessed people who felt that they needed to equip me. They needed to slay me and do different things to me to get me prepared for their kind of ministry. Listen, anybody God calls, God equips. God does it himself. It was God who equipped Moses. It was Moses who prepared Aaron for office and Aaron's sons. God told Moses to wash them in water, bathe them, and then strip them, and clothe them in the priestly garments. It was God who told Moses to do so. They could not do that to Moses. Moses was privileged to do that for them. God instructed him to do that for them. But they were not privileged to do that to Moses because Moses was their head. We have to understand ministry. When you find that somebody beneath you, somebody whom God has placed under you, God has made you a leader over that person, and that person wants to come and slay you and do you know certain things, you know that some, the spirit isn't right. That spirit wants to rule you. That spirit wants to lord it over you. That spirit wants to control you. Something is not right. The lesser cannot bless the greater. We have seen that in the Bible. Where Abram, after he met with Melchizedek, it was Abram who gave tithe to Melchizedek. And we are told in the New Testament, the book of Hebrews, that it was the lesser who paid tithe. The lesser, even though it was Abram who had the promises and the covenants, he had that call from God. But yet it was he who paid tithe to Melchizedek. Not, and it was Melchizedek who blessed him. The greater blessed the lesser. That's what the Bible says. Melchizedek wasn't a Jew. Abram was a Jew. But yet it was the greater who blessed him. God bless you. I trust that these words will be of comfort to you and strengthen you in Jesus' mighty name. Father, thank you for this opportunity you have given me to share your word. I pray you bless the listeners. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Praise God.